today for another live stream. Uh, we've got Carl Dakin and Paul Banks. Little confusion, but uh, Carl's coming right back, had a little microphone issue. Uh, really excited by uh, the conversation we're about to have. And here is Carl and here is Paul. So great. All worked out just in time. Sorry for the confusion. I apologize twice before you even got on the screen now. So uh, <laughs> Carl, is your mic working? No. Uh, so we'll, we'll um, open chat, which it is. Uh, today's event is raising capital. Uh, these events are getting extraordinary audiences and relevant uh, benefits uh, just because of focus and having people who actually know and have done what we're talking about. So Paul's been here before and uh, love to have Paul back. Love to hear what's new with Paul since uh, last get together and what his initial thoughts on raising capital. Paul? Thanks for having me, Don. Thanks for uh, thanks for inviting me back to the show. So, yeah, I... Oh, wow. What's what's been going on in my world? Um, just a lot of family time and a lot of busy. January has been so busy for business. Um, we started out with some some bad news at the beginning of the month with we're losing a, with losing a client. And but well, we've been really fortunate that pipeline's been good and people have been really busy this year. I think a lot of businesses are looking to kind of get ahead of the curve for 2024. They know that 2023 has been a tough year for a lot of people. And I think the, the emphasis is on getting something concrete in place for 2024's March and April start for the new financial year. Um, in terms of uh, raising capital, so it's, it's, an interesting, um, it's an interesting topic that I probably until about four or five years ago, I'd never really ventured into the area. Um, I've been networking with some amazing people and, and actually quite heavily involved at the moment in raising capital for different businesses um, globally as well as within the UK. Um, so, yeah, some some interesting points to come out of it all. I'll be interested to see where the, where the conversation goes, Don. Thanks for having me on. Oh, I think that that's why I have you on because part of everything is pairing, right? Bringing two people together with another person to create a, a better experience, but more importantly, a lot of knowledge here that even us on the stage get the benefit from for just being part of the conversation. So, Caro, are we back with sound? I hope so. Can you hear me? You did it. Yeah. You did it. Everybody <laughs> built expectation today between <laughs> length and microphones. They think we might have choreographed this. So, Carl, I just want to congratulate you. You had your first themed live stream yesterday. I was honored to be your first guest. I think you're just a natural. And uh, what was, you know, introduce a little bit about yourself and really about your experience yesterday. Sure. So um, uh, my background uh, is 45 years in working with uh, a lot of new businesses, startups, technology companies, and so forth. And Quite commonly, I, I drew the short straw and I got to be the person who had to figure out how to raise capital to move these businesses forward. So uh, 45 years later, I, I'm starting to figure it out. I think I have a, a better understanding of uh, how to align investors with individual companies. So there's more of a match and greater affinity, uh, which greatly improves the whole process of raising capital. So uh, I uh, have been working with Don now for a few months and uh, started a newsletter called Instant Funding, which uh, is 530 subscribers as of this morning. Uh, but this all work was intended to lead to my first uh, LinkedIn Live program yesterday, which I, I've titled Successful Funding. You can see I'm sticking to a theme here with funding and everything I'm doing. And it, it went very well because uh, we, we talked about community uh, as uh, an activity, a resource. We, we can give it all kinds of adjectives and even adverbs that having a group of people who you support and who support you is really essential for the success of your business. And when you get around to raising capital, uh, it may be the only thing that makes a difference between success and failure. 
So we, we had a really good conversation yesterday. Uh, we got Don's uh, community and my community mixing for the first time, and, and that seemed to work pretty well. And uh, just a really good conversation and a good experience and, and looking forward to programs going forward uh, where we're going to kind of dive in and talk about everything about raising capital. But as I mentioned yesterday, uh, quite a bit of raising capital is getting ready to raise capital, which covers almost anything in entrepreneurship. So we're going to be talking a lot about small businesses and different types of organizations and what they have in common when they need to go out and get more money than they currently have. OK, well, I think that's a great start. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's you know, everything here could be a stepping stone to something that's only better going forward because of the knowledge share, because of the free access to information and the ready access to it. But I think in Carl's uh, situation, just like 17 other people who have never been on a show now have a show in the last six months, uh, it's like expanding your profile on a bigger screen with more relevant audience you know, that now has moved to video and live streaming. You know, if they're progressive enough to move to the platform, then you should be on the platform in front of them or them in front of you, whatever. And I think that's really the key is elevating your voice that it gets above the mob and there's some, you know, clarity to it. So I think these programs do just that. With that said, I see Carrie's here. Carrie's here quite a bit. I will have to get a jack to raise capital. You know, Carrie's a interesting gentleman. Omar's here. Omar's a great guy, does Zoom party. I've been on the show. I won on the show. He invited my grandson to the show for kids Zoom party. Uh, so you can see how, how impactful this can be because it's only you who restricts your reach right and how you address it you know that post comment like that is like you know prehistoric you know nothing ever comes of it show me one person that ever made money doing that or created the opportunity they, they were seeking if it wasn't monetization versus got something to say say it in front of your right community and things can start to happen. So, uh, Paul, we, we didn't really get a chance to get a little background just for the new people or the people didn't see you on the show. So why don't you share a little bit about yourself and, and what's your vision for the 2024 looking like? Thanks, Don. Um, yeah, so my name's Paul. I run two separate businesses now. Um, Javelin Content Management, which is around, uh, and that's that's kind of where we connected, Don, which it, my business is around taking video content that's already out there, podcasts, video interviews with busy business leaders and repurposing that into hundreds of digital assets to give them back um, within a short period of time. Uh, a lot of people focus on quality and rightly so. Um, we dare to ask the question, what happens if you combine quality and quantity? Um, really consistently getting businesses out there without breaking the bank. Mm -hmm. And then Market and Help Desk, which I, actually ties in quite nicely with, with Carl's area. Uh, it's aimed at businesses that are before that point where they can afford to have a marketing agency. So helping businesses who are in that startup world who want to do their own marketing but just don't know where to start, don't know how to plan it, don't know where the strategy goes, and just helping business owners to do more of the right things themselves without kind of taking that out their hands. So that's a little bit about my professional background, where I am at. I've spent 15 years in retail, 10 years as a volunteer police officer. I've worked in lots and lots of different jobs. What brings me together is I'm super passionate about helping people make better decisions with their lives so they can lead the best lives that they want. Um, and along the way, I've become a bit of a, bit of a I guess, I don't, I don't really like the word super connector. I think it's overused and... Uh, it, it can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people, but I enjoy connecting the dots for people, which is how I got involved in capital raising for various businesses. Um, I've seen so many of these opportunities that, that have gone so far down the line, right to the very end conversations and then be thrown out the door by 
spurious words like ASAP. You know, I will I'll get this over to you ASAP three weeks later. Or oh, where's 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 the contract? Well, it hasn't arrived yet. I said I'd get it over as soon as I could. You know, you said ASAP. That was three weeks ago. Now now we're three weeks down the line. I don't trust you anymore. I'm not doing business with you. And I've seen fifty million dollar deals go down the pan or more because of conversations like that. Um, and it's it's interesting. I think twenty twenty four we'll see. You know, we've we've seen an uproot uproot in investment, especially in North America. You guys feel this more than anything in especially in the tech sector. Um, money's being expatriated back out the country again to to its home sources, and now more than ever, investors are more risk averse, more um, questioning and demanding of the startup founders. And unfortunately for startup founders, um, a lot of the time, you know, they're in the position where they've built this amazing product or service, and they rightly believe that they they've got something amazing. And you, you know, founders, if you're out there watching this, you do. But the challenge lies in accepting the fact that you're not the person with the money. And it's really hard to help business owners understand that they don't hold the cards. And it's kind of a lot of the time it is in the investor's hands. It's an interesting world helping businesses connect with the right investors. It really is. It's it's super hard to do well. People think it's really easy. You know, you've got somebody over here who's got a lot of money who wants to invest. And even the ones that want to invest still are really demanding. And you've got the guys over here who've got a great business and you can see the two should come together, but making them come together, you can take a horse to water done, but you can't always make the horse drink. Um, it is, it's, you can see Carl laughing. It's, it's challenging. I've, I've, worked with, I've worked with guys who refuse to, to go below $5 million investments because the risks are pretty much the same. The rewards are far greater. And the challenges actually become easier once you get above that $5 million mark because a lot of the time those businesses have already raised funds in the past. So they're used to it, they're experienced, they know that you know, we've got to have the data room ready, we know what due diligence we're going to have to have in place, we know what these guys are going to ask, we know how to tell the story, we're humble. Those sorts of things can sometimes be a bit easier above the $5 million raise mark. But there's far more entrepreneurs in that sub five million dollar, and if you can find somebody at the right point in time, there's some fantastic opportunities there. But it really is about it's it's dating for businesses. I'll, it's simple, right? It's dating for businesses. Well, you know, I think you make some wonderful points. I know that what you're saying is true, and and it is based on reality, not just projection. And what I'm starting to see is building businesses around a communication strategy than trying to develop a communication strategy around a business, right? So if you can, you know, if you're going to have a more cost, time efficient and higher performance communication rocket ship, you can put any load on, on it and change it. But to your point, how do you get relevancy to match up with relevancy? versus demand and supply? How do you say these personalities should be with these personalities, right? These objectives should match these commitments. And the last thing, not the last thing, but one of the most important things is cash flow. You know, how much are you burning? Because once you get a cash flow positive situation, at least the second raise isn't a definite. Yeah. Right. It's just a matter of how good are you when you get to burning out to see if it justifies a reinvestment. But people should be able to tell their story in their own voice, in their own way to their own specific audience. And you won't need a lot of intermediaries. Right. Everything is going, uh, you know, peer to peer, you know, less of uh, centralized elements. And that's what I see a show like this is onboarding, right? Yeah. LinkedIn and, and Restream create all of the stuff. It's the introduction. But here's the key is the integration. And then how do you use it as much as you can, just like, you know, uh, AI stuff. So I think that's the new turn is that people going out there for the first time should go out there at the present time, too many people are dragging legacy with them. You know, too many people are still getting by with the old stuff and they're 
whatever reason are changing, somebody could leapfrog right in front of them. And um, I think it's all about time and cost efficiency at the end of the day, because a product's a product, a service is a service, you know, and eventually the price will be determined by the marketplace. So how low of a cost can you have, which then has all kinds of implications on financing, right? If your, your margin's way high, if your cash flow is really good, what happens is you become the driver. I think the other thing that, that, that people don't realize, Don, is that brands, businesses, businesses that have a CEO or, or a founder or a senior leadership team who have a personal brand can raise capital in, it just makes things easier to raise a larger amount. If you've got a, a dedicated community that you can demonstrate, and as a, as a founder, you're the best salesperson in the business. You're also the most time poor person. So for me, you know, um, one to many relationships that you can build through community like this is crucial to your success. But if you as a, as a founder, if you're going out there to raise and you can demonstrate a dedicated community who believe in you, that adds dollars onto your revenue. That adds dollars onto your valuation because that's something that most businesses miss. Most businesses raise capital first, then ask the question, how can we build a community in a fan base? Mm. If you can do it on a shoestring, that demonstrates to your investors that you are social media savvy, that you know how to play the media game, and that you know how to make your business sticky, and that is worth 10 times more than any other metric that you can demonstrate. How you demonstrate it and how you tell that story is a different matter, but having that dedicated community is crucial, I think, to especially in the tech sector, where products and services are so complex and technical. Being able to talk about them in a way that is emotive to your intended audience, and I think that's relative as well, is... It's not just about having an audience. It's about having an audience that is um, very much targeted uh, in terms of either partners, channel partners, potential clients, and those that surround your potential clients. It doesn't need to be just potential clients, but it should be. You know, the more targeted that audience you can demonstrate, the much better that valuation should be. Well, and I think to your point, and I'll swing it right back to Carol, is what do you need the money for and why do you need the money? And why do you need as much as you do? Because it's so expensive up front when you do your first financing, right? And just getting what you need to get to where you need to then get what, I mean, if things are gonna improve faster, you're better off not selling too much of the future and just getting enough for that. And, you know, I think investors look at salaries that they look at perks, you know, they look, are these people really bootstrappers? Are these people willing to put some sweat equity into this game? I mean, because, you know, what you expect is what other people like you expect. And if you're going to meet common ground, the difference too is you're getting into a relationship, not a transaction, right? So when the check cashes, you got what's what's around the table and they want their money back as soon as they put it out there. Right. And you want to, you want your dream and your future and your everything to stay forever, Carol. Yeah. I'm just enjoying listening so far because I, I can make, I'm going to go back to this video recording of this because I already have about 20 topics in the last two minutes uh, for all my next shows going forward. Um, uh, one of the uh, statements Paul made that kind of ties into this is that if you stand as an entrepreneur on your soapbox and tell people about who you are, it's one voice. And you're talking about yourself, so everybody assumes that your voice is biased, no matter you know how correct or accurate you may be about the wonders of your business and its, its opportunity. But when you have a, a, a community who says, no, we, we all support that small business, each one of the people in that community is a form of endorsement of that business. So by having a large community, any investor, regardless what their motivation may happen to be, is looking at that business going, something's right about that business because they have all of these people standing up, pointing to the business and going, we like what they're doing. It, it's, it, it's a form of credibility. It, it gives the investor 
who may not understand the business or the market or the technology or whatever else behind it, it still gives them that comfort that this is this is a train I want to get on. This is a bandwagon I want to join uh, because all these other people have already done so. So it, it, I, I totally agree that the value of the business goes up by working in platforms like LinkedIn Live and whatever other mechanisms they come up with to share their story and communicate with their community. You know, so everybody's up to date. Everybody knows what's going on. It isn't three week old business. You know, it, it's something that happened this morning. And by having the platform uh, where a person can talk to their community weekly, daily, whatever that fits their, their capability, now the community knows the community's in a position to share that with all the people they know. And you get this exponential geometric cascade of information going out and it's coming off with a top spin or a, a word of mouth type of uh, uh, endorsement to that business. And anyone who's looking at it, whether they're looking for a straight ROI investment or they're doing it because they have some other uh, motivation to work with that business, is is going to favor that over everybody else who's raising money and 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 the point is is that there's way more businesses looking for smaller amounts of money and unfortunately over the last couple of years an even smaller amount of funders with that money and it, it's been hard for the last two years and and my forecast says this year is going to be harder than last year which is uh, right. a very difficult concept to get up in the morning with but um that's why I thought I would get into doing my own program because I'm helping all these organizations, mostly small businesses, but I just, uh, I'm putting a charity deal together this morning, which uh, I'm very happy about. Uh, and it's because I can reach out to my community and say, hey, I want to help this small business. Does anybody know who can help? It, it doesn't have to be dollars. It, it could be an endorsement. It could be opening a door for somebody. It, it could be borrowing you know, their building or their meeting room or some other asset that they have available that constitutes an investment in my large definition. So I, I really see LinkedIn Live as uh, something that every business should consider. Uh, they do have to use it correctly. They have to understand it's not a simple give me, give me thing. It is a community building tool. And if they use it effectively, then their community grows and that's going to help them not just in raising capital, but in anything they're going to do. Yeah, I, I you know, when you really start to peel everything back, and like I say on, on live streaming, the, the deeper you go, the richer it gets, the more nuanced it gets and the more connected to so much it gets. And I think what we can all agree on, if everything can be commoditized, it really comes down to the value of information that's being distributed in the most relevant, timely way. So by having something like this, which is access, you've already said you've learned about 20 subjects just from Paul. Well, what does that say for a founder who is out there getting counseling, getting mentorship, getting information on their own show, on other people's shows, because what happens is you you actually build a very legitimate uh, engagement group who are really on the same page with each other, working with each other, promoting each other. And now you get more exponential leverage plus the benefit of association and identification you know, it's not the best. It's the people that, you know, that are known. You know, it's top of mind awareness. And the other thing is consistency. You know, in the past, you'd be on this show, that show, you'd, you'd, you'd be around. But when you can say, hey, I'm going to have a residency on LinkedIn, just like people in Vegas, right? They got tired of traveling. They're at the same place downstairs three months. And why not have a residency on LinkedIn when what's the cost? And you know what the cost is? Onboarding. Because once you get on, you're on. And you don't need well, anybody if you don't want anybody. Go ahead, Carol. Yeah, the, the one of the things that you shared with me when we first started talking about this is that you have all these people on LinkedIn 
And uh, there's a very small group who actually uses LinkedIn. And then there's a smaller group who does this. And then even a smaller group that is using LinkedIn Live as a communication tool. And, and because of that fact, if you use it as a tool, you're automatically differentiating yourself from everybody else who otherwise would be viewed, you know, your competitors and you in the same, same group. And they're going, well, I've got 100 things to invest in today, but this one's on LinkedIn Live, you know, once a week or, or whenever. And, and therefore, um, the back of their head, I don't know what it is, but there's an automatic, well, they must be better. I should start with them instead of the other ones who aren't doing that. You're top of mind. You become top of mind. And it's it's about creating that conservation. It's a small business. That's really cool to do um, because it, it gives you, like you say, a distinct advantage of the opposition. It's, guess what? If you don't do it, your competition will do it. And, and if and they beat you to the mark, they're going to have that conservation ahead of you. Right? Yeah, and then it's a matter of, of time efficiency for the small business. We never have enough hours in the day. And and so I had a wonderful lunch meeting with a guy yesterday uh, that I met. Uh, we talked as long as we could before we had to go do something else. Uh, but it, it, I had to drive to the meeting. I was in the meeting an hour and a half. Then I had to drive home. So it was about two and a half hours of my day in a single meeting. And again, I got up this morning. I posted my newsletter uh, and 530 people received my newsletter this morning. And, and yep. uh, I'm sitting there going, hmm, the time efficiency is pretty obvious to me that yep. I'm going from one person, which doesn't mean I don't have to do one-on-one -on -one and face-to-face -face meetings, but that versus getting out to this and then doing my LinkedIn live show, which yeah, yesterday was a start. Uh, and we're gonna build up a massive community with this over time but I'm more efficient with my time that way. And, and that is essential for the success of a small business. Well, you and, know, then, and then to add to that, you can, you can then take that LinkedIn live and repurpose it because I'm you've sure. already got the content there. So then you've got content, you know, you can do, I've seen business owners take one 30 minute conference, one 30 minute live stream, webinar, interview, whatever. And they've created enough content. And I do this all the time for a whole month, just from that one video. You turn it into quartz images, you turn it into animated quartz, you turn it into audiograms, short clips, clips for TikTok. I'm, you know, like I've said this to Don last, last time I was on. I'm like, I'm on every channel. I don't create content separately for every channel because who has time for that unless you're a, you're a full-time content creator and that's your business, right? I, I'm not. I've got clients I need to service. So I want to be as efficient as I can with the content that I create so I can get back on with running my business. And everybody yeah, out I'm, there is exactly the same. I'm hopeful that my conversation with Don would give me at least, you know, 20 or 30 epiphanies that I can share in shortcuts, you know, as we go forward. Um, I, but it's one of the things I'm learning about uh, is that uh, I hadn't done this before. And, and so after the LinkedIn Live program was over, I got the notice from Restream, which is the tool we're using to do part of the broadcast. They have a recording of the entire thing. And then I experimented with loading that into Read AI to see if it would do some sort of uh, cutting and dicing of it. But then it was also recorded on uh, LinkedIn. So it, it's out there. It's going to be out there forever. And at the same time, though, uh, as you described it, uh, because we've created this, this is another asset that we can put into different formats and share with people in a, a short podcast or pull a single idea and make it part of my newsletter so I, I can reuse this going forward and and that's more efficiency and use of my time that I'm really uh, really focusing on well, well, to, to your point Don we, we talk about bootstrapping businesses to raise mm -hmm. funding like if you're a small business that wants to bootstrap to raise funds and you want to prove that you're efficient as as efficient as possible you better be sure that you're using, you're ringing every piece of content that you've got out and demonstrating that to your investors. And if you can, like, I I know lots of businesses that heavily invest in SEO, pay-per-click, paid advertising, and then they come to me six months down the line and go, Paul, I've put thousands into these and I've driven one or two leads. I don't know what they're doing. They said they were experts. They're not experts. What I know is I'm an expert. I, I need to demonstrate that on camera and I want to build a social brand. The problem is they generally come to me too late because they've already blown their money, right. wasted it on other things, and 
and they've let their network referrals, their, their founder sales dry up. And they've then come to the point where their pipeline is starting to empty out because their existing deals are either converting or failing. And there's nothing new going into it because they've exhausted their own black book and their network. Now what? You should have done this six months ago. So build it before you need it is something I say to a lot of people. Build it before you need it. And exactly as you're, you're, you're shouting about, Don, is you absolutely need to be doing this now before it becomes a problem because it will happen. It happens to every founder at some point. Your network gets exhausted and well, you get the channel. You know, these are just wonderful, pragmatic uh, conversations for anybody who's not as attuned to this or is involved in it. And uh, to what Paul said that resonated was you want to be a specialist. Right. I mean, if you look at the ticker, let's develop your own theme live stream with my website. No one's ever reached out to go there and say they were there. But meanwhile, every investment oh, uh, advisor should be able to say, I can suit you up with a live stream. See, it's one thing to tell somebody you should have one. Well, how do you do it? And, and well, I don't know, but you need to get one. Versus, hey, I got it's like a tailor. I got I got a place. Go in, you get fitted, they get you up to scratch, and then you you go forward. And that's what I I thought at the lowest common denominator is just go from where you are to where you want to be, where you're at, because most people use LinkedIn for lead generation or business development, which means they got to take them off of here to sell them a car or insurance or whatever service. So why not make people better? And actually it's in LinkedIn's advantage. And since LinkedIn doesn't pay for your content, they reward you with uh, reach, right? So when you go into LinkedIn and there's some cost of membership and, and you gotta buy some apps like Restream, people then take the, the smallest, most, unexciting thing, which is posting and commenting and throw them whole, their whole self at it. And nothing ever happens because I did it for two and a half years before I found live streaming. I was good. I got 37,000 connections. I was, ta I was everything LinkedIn gave me, I was going to the limit. 125 tags a day, a newsletter, a poll. I was using every tool in the case. And that's what I'm advocating when I gave all that up and I never really monetized anything because there was no, no real additional value except me and maybe hard work to something that says, hey, I'm just going to tell you who I am because people like doing business with people they like and trust and know. And that's all you have to do is allow the airwaves to take you out there into all kinds of areas. Because sooner or later, when I'm finding about LinkedIn, there's a lot of people have never been in business, really. There's a lot of people have never signed checks, right? And when it comes to pulling the trigger, they're used to getting something before they do something. They're, they're, they're more uh, <coughs> risk aversive. But who wants to step up and say, well, what I would do if I was going to LinkedIn, I go right to live stream. But what I tell everybody who's listening and will listen to this, just log your time and what you do on LinkedIn every day. You don't go there that often. You don't spend that much time. It's probably four notations. So do it for a week and add it all up and ask yourself, what did you get this week? And then ask yourself, what's going to change next week? And when are you going to fast forward enough to see it's not working? And it never will if that's your purpose. Versus, hey, you got something to say, say it. I always said even earlier in the show, if I was out of work, I'd turn on a live stream at 9 a.m., take a break for lunch and keep broadcasting for the rest of the day. Just kind of, yeah. here's where I am. Here's what I'm doing. Here's what I like. Is there anybody out there? Think, Go ahead, Paul. There's there's a there's a, a, a short story that was shared with me by uh, a manager I had in retail, and it kind of whilst 
she was an interesting personality, but she was she was a lot younger than me, but she had a lot to say and she was right about a lot of it. And I think that makes people extra smart when they're young and they haven't got a great deal of experience, but they understand the principles of leadership. And the same applies here for business founders. Um, there's nothing creates um, trust and loyalty like vulnerability. And live streaming exhibits your vulnerabilities like no other platform. Um, if, you, if you take dogs, for example, right, a, a new member of a pack um, will be challenged by the by the leader of the pack and their response, if they want to stay alive, is to lie down on the floor, roll over and show their belly because they're showing vulnerability. You can attack me if you want to, but I'm here to be subservient and be part of your group. And you're here to be of service. And that's what we're seeing here for founders is you want to be of service to the people that you sell your services and products to. You need to show that vulnerability where you can, not not overboard, but to, to demonstrate that you can be vulnerable. And there is nowhere better to show it than than in video of, of, of all things, because then you can show transparently, you can show who you are, you can organically grow your audience. And the other thing to say is, I'm going to throw this out there, you know, you need to piss off 90% of your community because by doing that, you'll find the 10% that resonate with what you're aligned with. They're your client base, they're your community and they're your people and they will be loyal to the death for you. Indifference is what kills businesses. Well, you're so right. And what I found, action makes things happen. When I had my businesses, it wasn't, do I want to do something? I got a payroll. <laughs> I got rent, right? It isn't like, do you feel like this is a good day? And I had to keep making deals, putting relationships together to keep, keep it rolling. And until you're under the gun, and in most cases, you know, there's a saying, if you're not working on the edge, you're taking up too much space, you know? And sometimes people get in trouble because they get too ambitious, too aggressive. But, you know, here's the thing. 90% of stuff goes wrong you never you never expected. You could never plan for, right? I, I've been in businesses where the business was great and the industry fell apart, right? Like during construction, like 40% of sales and tools disappeared overnight. And it didn't matter. And, and if you're growing, you're even in worse shape because you're expecting more growth. So now you're getting more space and more people and you're training and when everything backs up, that's what shows you who you're with. Because you want the person that can be out there in a storm, not just in the sunshine. You want somebody that can make some moves because a lot of times you're right. You gotta go for the lifeboat over the sinking boat. And you gotta make those decisions and a lot of them involve people, which is even more difficult for people. You can cut an expense or a, a warehouse, but when you start saying goodbye to people that had nothing to do with them having to say goodbye to you, uh, you know, that that's the key. And I think most people who invest do too much due diligence on the numbers and not the people. And I'm not talking about backgrounds. I'm just talking about having a conversation like now because well, that, that goes both ways. I, I mean, I, I, I'm very frustrated uh, when I'm working with a small business who is willing to take a check from anybody who can move a hand across, you know, the, the, the check note. And, and I go, did you check them out to see, you know, what kind of investor are they going to be? Or are you going to have to hold their hand? Are they going to be looking over your shoulder? But more importantly, is that all they're going to do is write a check? Uh, I, I really uh, prefer not to take any investment from anybody on any project unless I know that investor is going to become my number one uh, fan. They're going to be advocating and singing my praises. They're going to be looking to make introductions. They're going to help me sell products. Uh, I, I want them to be at all. I don't want just a one-dimensional type of investor because uh, Frankly, I can find lots of those. Uh, no matter how hard the deal is, I can find somebody who fits that definition. I want the all-in person uh, to be my uh, investor on any particular project because back to efficiencies. If 
if they are only going to write me a check, I still have to go find a customer. I still have to go find somebody to sing my praises. But if I can do it all in one person, then I'm, I'm being efficient with my relationships. Yeah. The thing is that, that out there somewhere is the investor that can bring the 800 pound gorilla to your door. It's just a matter of finding them. And it's tiring. I get it. Like you sit there and pitch and it's hours and hours in front of each investor. And for a lot of founders out there, I think sometimes they feel like all they ever do is raise money. Because as soon as one round's closed, they're thinking about the next round and they're out there again. And it takes them away from selling their business to the people that matter, that they set out to help in the first place. But out there, and I've seen this happen, there is an investor who is heavily invested in somebody who will provide the biggest client you've ever seen to you straight to your door because you solve the exact problem they're trying to solve. And by bringing the two businesses together, the sum of the parts is greater than the whole. But well, and, yeah. there are so many intermediaries that, that say they can do these things that just don't. Well, There's well, a lot of connectors that don't. Well, that's, that, that, that's okay. where going the direct approach makes the most sense. And it is the marketing, the PR, everything that can make or break a company or at least make a big difference in how well the company performs. But the bigger challenge is how does the company communicate with all of their vested, interested parties, right? How's the company talking to the employees? How's the company talking to their product and service providers? How are they talking to their investors? You know, so if you can say, Start, you know, because everybody can look at a new idea or a technology and say, well, that's interesting, but whatever, whatever. But what are you doing now? That's the key. You, what's your PR strategy? What's your employee? What are you using? You know, are you having people fly in every month and talk to you for two days and fly it out when you could have a live stream that's private? You know, get all your designers Tuesdays at 9 a.m. and hey, where are you saving money? Where can we do something better? It's the knowledge share among everybody where the total value comes from. And then it's people smart enough to collaborate, right? If you said, hey, if, if let's say Carl says, hey, this is a great idea. Everybody I bring in, I'm going to allocate $900 to, to, to get a live stream for the first two months, right? And it, you could say that's on me even. Because if you're an investor in it or a vested party, why not invest in it going forward to something you know might guarantee their success? And I think, well, go, go let ahead. Me, let me speak to that, Don, because it's come up in a number of um, projects and potential projects recently where somebody says, I need to raise a significant amount of money. And here uh, I'm typically talking less than five million, but still it's more than, uh, money's gonna come out of my pocket. Uh, the cost of putting together the capital campaign, there's, that's a, its own cost. People don't think about it. They, they talk about the cost of money, the you know, interest rate on a loan or whatever they're gonna give up in future profits. But there is a cost to invest into raising capital. And uh, we've seen a number of projects recently where we're going to group A to get the money to put together the capital campaign. Uh, which could include a LinkedIn live show as one of the components of that campaign to build the community and get the word out and so forth. And that cost is minor compared to the larger dollars that they're looking to raise. But too often people will go to a broker who wants some large commission to introduce you to a very small group of their people, which may or may not over invest. And then you go through that loop incessantly until you run out of time and money. Where if you had taken a small amount of money, even raising that money from investor A to go find investor B and used it to build your community and build your company communication channel, you have an asset that's going to continue going forward and continue mm -hmm. growing in value. And, and so we're, we're seeing somewhat what we call two-step uh, investments where if you can't get to where you want to go with the first step, then step back halfway and start as something smaller, something doable. But build on that towards your larger campaign is becoming something I'm talking to a lot more people about uh, because they're, they're different investors, different reasons, different motivations get involved earlier. Uh, but they actually the, the payday could be larger because of that. Absolutely. And 
when you look at it, you know, and I've always wanted to do something important, distinctive, differentiated, is be the, you know, the onboarder, right? And just people can say, if, uh, if, if you can be successful with 10 of your companies, right, then 10 of you will have 10 companies who say, how do I get this person suited up? Right. If it just becomes an expense of theirs and a time investment on the individuals or the founders, but it also makes founders know how to talk better. It makes founders share their voice enough to get their voice back in a better fashion. So it's really about optimizing. And I look at it like, you know, if you had a deal with cars, there's just places that do transmissions, right? There's places that just do mufflers. So if everybody, like Paul says, hey, I'm the repurposing person, then you can get bundling because Carl could say, hey, I can get you a live stream. I can get you hooked up to this because once someone can prove it, right, because it all comes down to value creation and value appreciation. If Carl could say, here's my story. I started going to Don's show, being on Don's show, joining Don's program, getting my show, extending it here. So it is like an aircraft carrier where you just keep launching them, you know, and, and you say, why not get a competitive advantage, right? So person who got the fax machine, which was a funny thing, who did they fax to? But they had a competitive advantage over the people who couldn't. Because when I had stores, I could run one fax to seven stores and say new special, new ad change, and it was so much more efficient than what you had. So why not leapfrog all of these people who are resisting it? Most of them don't know it exists. And if they do, they're stigmatized by video, which is editing, production, scripting, performing. It's a major something, and it really doesn't mean anything at the end because it's either plain vanilla because it's so edited or it's like they didn't take the time to make it a little bit cleaner. Where live stream is trust yourself to be in the moment. And people want to see how you respond to things in the moment, right? You can't plan for these things. And I think that's so important. And there's so many people on LinkedIn who spend so much time and so much money and have no future if they keep going the way they're going. They're going to time out or wear out or give up. And that's just the truth. And again, if you're looking to build it as a B2B side, right? If it's a social platform, if it's just entertainment and hanging out with it, that's terrific. It doesn't cost you that much. But at least you're clear as to why you're here and what you're expecting to get from it. And why not get all you can as fast as you can, where now you're not really worried about customers you're worried about or concerned more about extending value creation, right? Because at that point, pricing goes out the window, Paul. Yeah, I, th I was just going to say, I think you made a great point around video and how it's moved on. Um, so I see a lot of people coming to me and still the, the main conversation is, oh, can you create me um, like a video about my services, but I don't want to be in it. I just want you to use stock footage and put some music over and a voiceover. And can you can you use AI for the voice? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I can, but I'm not going to. Like, oh, well, why? Well, because you're not creating a connection with your audience. That that's outdated, and it's like, yes, I know there's AI software that can do that for you now. Like, you don't even need to have a human involved in the process. Just just give it just give it an idea, and it'll run and create the video for you. What's the point? I think. Um, then there's the other end of the spectrum, which is, oh, this is brilliant. We need to create a super polished, super clean video that we can send to an agency. It'll cost us like $15,000. They'll have it back to us in about four months and we'll get two minutes for our time. And that's outdated as well. Like those days are past. Like the, the, the point of the matter is exactly what you're saying right there, Don. It's not, it's not just about live stream, but it is about capturing yourself in the moment, being prepared to be vulnerable in the moment, being organic and transparent, capturing where you're at, what you're doing. If there's bloopers, they're great because it shows you're a human being and demonstrating yourself to be the expert that you are, um, sh showcasing a little bit of 
like not just the business side of things, like a little bit about, you know, you often hear my son screaming downstairs whilst I'm on the podcast. I can't do anything about it. Like he's there. It's five and a half months. It happens. <laughs> but I think, you know, just daring to be a little bit less polished, but to do things, to swap that up for efficiency, right? To, to be able to be efficient, to get yourself back to being the business owner that you need to be. Hit your step away from things. Allow it to be a little bit, not quite a hundred percent. Don't don't aim for perfection with your video. Just do things in the moment. You know, capture it on your phone if you have to. You know, I've seen people doing live streams from their phone. Like, however you do that, make it you. But make sure that whatever you put out on that other side of things is a hundred percent you. Don't try and be somebody that you're not, because that's yeah, where you'll get caught out. I um, I've had talked to a number of small businesses about the opportunity to be on LinkedIn Live, and and one common thing that comes back to me is, well, what am I going to talk about during all that time? And um, and and I finally I've come up with the answer to that question, which is quit talking about yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> get on a program and you know bring on a guest who could be a supplier who could be your banker could be anyone's a service provider any of your customers anyone who has anything to do with your business and simply ask them how that business can help that particular person who's your guest in that show because these are all part of your community you don't exist in a vacuum as a small business uh you couldn't do it you would do it if some people weren't out doing what they do you know, to make these tools or these services or, or something available to you. And, and as you build your community, you essentially are just creating more guests for your guest list on LinkedIn Live. You could talk forever. Uh, you're never going to run out of people uh, that you can help through the success of your business and what you're doing with your business and explaining how you work with everybody. So, um, I, and I think by doing that, and I, I, I was joking recently with a guy, I said, uh, I said, did you ever ask an investor what else you could do in the deal to make it better for him? And he goes, well, no, I, I made my offer and he's either going to take it or leave it. And I said, and he probably is going to leave it. But if you ask that one more question, what could I do this deal to make it special for you, to make it give you more benefit, to get you a little further down the road, whatever it is you're looking for. And, uh, and we come up with these interesting things like this charity thing that happened uh, this morning where we're getting a corporate sponsor from a company to a charity uh, because it's good for both of them, but it came out of building gifting into an equity crowdfunding campaign. We were looking for that one more thing we could do and we found one and it, it's kind of cool. So uh, looking forward to the, you know, these kinds of dialogues where as you talk about it, you're, you're basically being transparent. You're who you are. You're talking to your community and your community is going to grow because of that, because people will say, hey, this is a group of people who appreciate each other. They're all working together. I would like to be part of that group. And, um, and what I got to do, join. Well, you know, I think, you know, being teachable and being open to ideas and thoughts without judgment uh, goes a long way because you show up the way you help other people show up, right? Have you ever been at dinner and some one one side of the couple is embarrassing the other one and everybody in the restaurant feels bad for everybody, including themselves, right? So when people get their chance in the spotlight, are you making the light a little brighter for them? Are you being more cordial? Because it shows the character of the person you know, the integrity, and that's the things that can come through on a live. When you compare it to a post and, and a comment and a like, it, there's a time frame, there's a in, not knowing the sincerity of the person, the empathy, because that's what people want to know is when things go bad, who are you? Are you going to be around? Are you going to be worrying about us as much as yourself? And I think over time, people can't live a lie forever, especially before they even met you, right? So over time, and I think it's consistency, and I think Carol makes a great point, your story is your story. They're here to improve their story, right? What do you got to give them at the end as a door prize for showing up today? You know, did you give them a tip? Did you give them some inspiration? Did you give them access to you? Uh, you know, what I'm curious, 
I know we're at the end of the show almost, is why don't anybody out there comment saying where you're from? Because I'll tell you what, we've got an incredible viewership. You know, I think over 100 people are viewing this right now. And either they're so enthralled with what we're saying that they don't want to comment and disturb it, uh, or there's some issue. And that's another thing about knowledge here. If I find something wrong with Restring, I'll tell Carl, I'll tell Harvey, uh, Kelly. You know, that's how we can learn together. And that's the benefit is what did you hear? How soon did you hear it? What's going to change? Or I did this. You know what I learned in the last week? Every one of my events is number one on LinkedIn in every category. You know, and it will continue to be because I kind of figure out what it takes. And I think that's another thing. Most people don't go the extra mile. They don't even go the first mile. And curiosity will kind of drive, hey, this don't make a lot of sense. Let me ask somebody. Let me Google it. Let me YouTube it. You know, is, is knowledge is power, faster knowledge, faster distribution of knowledge and dependability and consistency of knowledge, right? If all the time you bring more value than you ask for, you're going to get invited to all kinds of places and introduced to all kinds of people, right? If you had somebody call you up, I said, I got a horse in the third and they gave it 20 straight horses in a row. You'd be like, how much can I bet? Right. It's, it's not a lot of let me in. But I think here's the key. We're all doing our thing. All of us have opportunities for all of us. Right. And I'm into like packaging and subscriptions. So it's like, you know, Paul has a service of Carl has a service and you're at the at the top shelf area. Right. Where you really do bring value. People are really happy working with you then why not we get triple exposure just the three of us together if we paired our channels we get all of our audiences seeing at once and all of our audiences seeing each other so the key is is how do you scale this thing how do you leverage to be more exponential you know how do you get twice as many impressions with the same amount of work and to paul's point how much do you repurpose Right. A lot of people take the cream and don't even know there's anything of value besides it. And it's really that residual income or continuing income. I've got 700 hours on YouTube I've done nothing with. I got probably 20 books, 42, this, 30. But here's the thing. you got to be able to work it. You know, so Paul, uh, Paul, I think you've got a pr prospective uh, customer <laughs> here with <laughs> Well, I'm not alone because Kelly's got hundreds of hours. Harvey does. We all do. And, and, and if one could say as a selling point, if you create and develop your show, you'll also be creating a value add here with your information. You can make courses out of it. You can make speaking opportunities out of it. Uh, plus, yeah. you know, I was talking to a major booker of speakers and she was telling me, Panels are starting to get popular, right? Two or three people coming together on a subject, right? Just like we're doing. I think this is so much more colorful and interesting than one of us talking to the audience or one of us talking to each other. And yep. I think that's keep. I actually like one of my one of my key clients. Um, my my target audience is keynote speakers who just want to get more opportunities to speak. They want to be seen as more of a thought leader and it works for them like exactly as you're saying Don it's it's but you're absolutely right I think if more people approached networking with an entrepreneurial attitude not just their own business but on but networking with an entrepreneurial attitude not how can I make referral fees out of this but actually how can we work together to create something that's great like and I use this a lot something that's greater than the sum of its parts like how do you make one plus one equal three with what we've got and you know i as an example like I, I find a lot of people are anxious about getting on video um when they do say they'll commit to doing a video for me they tend to move it back in their diary they procrastinate on doing it and and then they're also worried about garbage in garbage out if if they don't give me good quality results how can they expect to get results out at the end of it so i brought someone in who is a, a senior bbc editor to work with my clients and she's qualified 
was literally qualified to help them create video. And it's it's been the unblocker that I needed. It's something so, so simple. It cost me next to nothing. And she's over the moon because she's got remote work coming out of her ears. I'm handing her clients all the time. My clients are over the moon because all their fears have disappeared. And I'm over the moon because people are moving through my pipeline. So it's it's about spotting those things in your network and the people that you communicate with and finding a way to add value to them, to their audience, to you and your audience and your clients specifically. No, that's perfect because whatever complements what you're doing improves what you're doing. And it opens up monetization opportunities like uh, affiliate programs, right? The ability, because at a certain point you say, what does it cost me? And that's why affiliate programs have done so well, like CJ and I used to be a big player there, is what's the cost of getting a customer? Would you pay 10% of the sale and focus on the sale and the customer then getting the next customer. But more importantly, when it's coming from a trusted advisor or relationship, that even brings more value to the product and to you because you're not starting fresh. And you've got an obligation to the person who sends you this business. So you want to make sure that they get, you know, quality results in order for the, to keep the stream going. So self-interest builds mutual interest um, but it has to start with mutual value and interest and you know what happens too is you're not living in a vacuum say well I, hey I, I could do some of that and add that to it or hey maybe we do more of this because it's it's really up to the demand of, and then if you create these programs to promote real value added opportunities so we're, we're not getting into salesy situations but we're getting into uh discovering things with people and what we learned and i think everybody would rather hear what you did than you tell them what they should do and allow them to learn from reflection and not have pressure so anyways it's been a great show paul carl i think there's going to be more opportunities between us going forward based on today and that's as it should be and I guess one last question before I turn over to final thoughts is everybody should be asking themselves, who do I plan on working with going forward that can make a difference for all of us? Uh, so, Paul, thank you for your visit back. What's your final thoughts? I think it's been enlightening. I think um, I must admit I was a little bit anxious when you said that the topic was capital after I agreed to do the show. Um, yeah. I wasn't, wasn't actually convinced on how much value I'd be able to add, but I've really enjoyed the conversation. I think it's, and I think it's, you know, you, you bring to the table, it's surprising when you actually just get up there and put yourself on the on the podium, what you can actually add to, to your audience. So no, thank you very much for adding me along, Don and Carl, being fantastic to meet you. Well, I can't, I can't, I would second that. And, uh, you know, it really does show what someone knows in the moment, right? Something happens, but the beauty of it is you ignite through somebody else's comment or somebody else's idea, and that takes away the necessity to prepare or presume or worry about audience reaction. Uh, so that makes it so cool. Carl, you're, you're one day away from your, your big launch. Yeah, I'm feeling famous already. So uh, uh, <laughs> nonetheless, uh, the, you know, the points we raised today are good that, you know, investor is a person and the value you bring to them is something that you have to explore. And the, quite often they don't know what value you can bring. So you have to communicate that. And, and that's why I like what you know, Paul is bringing to the table is once I know who to talk to, I still have to get the story across. And LinkedIn Live is one of many tools that I'm using in my toolbox uh, to, to try to communicate who I am and what I do and how I think. But I, I'm really open to meeting more people through LinkedIn Live who want to join my community, uh, which will give me more opportunity to talk about things like this. So uh, thank you, Don, for, for being on the show today. You bet. Thank you. Uh, thank the audience. And uh, look forward to coming back tomorrow. It'll be Kelly and Harvey, and uh, we'll do it all again. Take care. Bye for now.